Okay, so welcome everyone to, to this webinar. So today I'm your host, I'm Cristina, and today we will talk about the potential of data-driven models for rural development. So we will focus specifically on how to improve energy access strategies in the Global South. Just to talk a little bit about me, so you can get to know me. My background is in civil engineering, and uh, I'm originally from Guatemala. But then I got a scholarship to study my master's here in Europe. So it was in Spain and in France, in which I specialized in the field of energy and environmental engineering. So more in deep about my interests, I'm an enthusiast to solve global development challenges. And I think that my main motivation for doing this is because I come from a developing country. So I know specifically what are the needs. I'm currently on my third year of PhD at ETH and EMPA. And I'm working on, on developing data-driven models in order to solve these global development challenges. So a little bit more about myself and what I'm doing in my free time is besides being my, my focused uh, on the research side, let's say, I also paint in my free time. So that's, that's another hobby that I have. Two truths and one lie about me is that I lived in more than five countries I'm a very, very, very sportive person and I love doing field work. So in this picture, you can see myself doing, doing field work and I think that I look quite happy. So I would suggest that the last one is one truth and you can guess which one is a lie. So what's the problem what, that we are trying to solve? 11% uh, of the global population lacks access to electricity. And as you can see here in this map, most of them are located in Sub-Saharan Africa South Asia and Latin America. So what are we doing about it? In the year 2015, the United Nations, as, as I would know that you, that you already have knowledge of it, uh, they launched the Sustainable Development Goals. And among all of these goals, there is the goal number seven, which is to ensure access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all. So why should we focus on this goal? That's because there have been a lot of studies that have been done regarding this, what causes um, or which benefits can we get from electricity access or clean energy access. And just to mention some of them, it has been proven that extends the study hours for children, so they will be able to study during the night hours. It reduces the domestic work burden for women through the me mechanization of work and through this mechanization of work, it also increases the economic activity of people in these areas. It increases access to information and entertainment as well, and it decreases household indoor air pollution. And why we are focusing on the last one, the last one is very important. As you may know, they have to meet their energy requirements with some fuels, which are basically uh, these dirty fuels or fossil fuels in which they have to uh, burn and then they get all of this smoke inside of the house. And according to, to the World Health Organization, this is one of the most uh, popular causes of premature deaths in developing countries. So what are the potential solutions for rural electrification? You may think, yeah, and why we shouldn't just extend the national electricity grid to these areas, but actually, in a lot of developing countries, the geography wouldn't help because these areas, these rural areas will be right in the high of the mountain, for example, and this will make it really, really expensive and unattractive to investors. So that's why we got other different solutions in which we can take advantage of the natural resources on site, such as uh, solar lamps, as you can see here in the first picture, uh, solar home systems as well, or individual systems, and also mini grids or micro grids. So what these mini grids are is basically a, a group of renewable energy technologies that generate electricity to a certain amount of households that is not connected to the national grid. So for any of these solutions, we would require to know how much electricity will the people in this area consume. And due to the lack of data from developing countries, that's quite a challenge. And that's why in my research, we are proposing a data-driven model using publicly available data 
in order to, to create a model that can estimate accurately the energy demand of rural households in developing countries. And this model is based on the core model, taking different case studies in Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and Latin America. And then we are trying to extrapolate these results so it can be applicable to other parts in the world. So that's what I call the upscaling analysis. So current models, uh, they have a lot of knowledge gaps or research gaps, I would say, because they need really specific site data as input. So this means that all the project developers have to travel to these rural areas in order to get all the data that they need in order to input it to their models. And this, of course, will make the project more expensive. And these models are also based on assumptions due to the lack of information, as I already mentioned. And some of them are quite based on a rule of thumb um, method. So for example, if this mini grid uh, load profile, uh, it's for that we gather from India, that will be probably the same in Guatemala, which of course is not the case. So they, they usually make a lot of those assumptions, which we are trying to, to tackle. So in our model, we are using publicly available data as input to create high resolution load profiles from rural households and to try to characterize as well electricity consumers in these areas. So how are we doing this? Well, actually we are collecting data from national household surveys from every single country's Bureau of Statistics. We are also taking data from international organizations such as the World Bank. We are also taking imagery, uh, satellite imagery as well into account. We are taking different case studies that, that have been already developed in different parts of the world in which data have been gathered. And we are also developing our own fieldwork. So I will talk a little bit more about this in the other slides. So for modeling, um, we are using R. So this is an, a statistical and programming language. So I decided to use this because it has already a lot of statistical packages that were quite convenient to apply in my research. So for example, um, we are using all of this data that we gathered in order to create huge data sets from different parts of the world for which we are training different machine learning models in order to predict certain things. So for example, the first step is to try to predict how many appliances, household appliances would they have? For example, how many TVs, how many radios, how many cell phones would they have in their houses? So for doing this, we are applying different machine learning net methods. So just to show you some, this is the random forest. So it's basically a bunch of, of decision trees in which they make the decision. It can be applied in, um, for both regression and classification problems. So for example, here is for a classification problems, for problem, and then they will pick the most voted uh, result. And then we have, for example, gradient boosting machine in which these are also ensemble methods. And these are aimed to reduce the error, the prediction error in each iteration. So I'm mentioning both of them because those are the ones that quite are quite performant for my research, for example. So as I already mentioned, I'm using these models, I'm creating these models in order to identify how many household electrical appliances would they have. And then I evaluate each of these models based on the prediction error. So now that we know how many appliances do they have in their houses, how will we know when are they using these appliances? When are they turning on the lights? When are they turning on the, the TV? At which time of the day, for example? So for doing this, we are creating an occupant or human behavior model. So I know that you may think you know, modeling human behavior is not that easy. <laughs> and of course it's not because we are quite, we act in a very random way. So how can we model this? Well, what we are doing, the data-driven approach as well, is that the World Bank uh, deploys different household surveys around the world in which they include a section of time use. So this section of time use comes in different versions. So this is an example for Tanzania. And this is the example of a template of a diary. 
So what it does is that it records all the activities that households are performing at each time step of the day. And the time steps uh, vary from country to country, of course. So here for Tanzania, for example, they had to record what kind of activities were they doing in 24 hours at every 15 minutes. So what are we doing with these diaries or what are we doing with this useful information that we have out there? And then applying, apl applying this Traminer. So this is a tool that does a sequence analysis in R as well. So it was deployed in the University of Geneva here in Switzerland, and it helped us to analyze the sequences of categorical data, because that's what we got from these data sets that I just showed you. So what it helped us to do is to try to categorize or classify different people and different behaviors that can be expressed like this. So this is also an example for Tanzania. So here, this analysis, the sequence analysis, help us to identify that in Tanzania, there are four clusters of people with, which perform different kinds of activity during the day. So here, each color represents one activity. And here you can see what, they, what are the probabilities of performing one activity at each time of the day. So, for doing this clustering analysis, we applied hierarchical clustering techniques. And then to add more stochasticity and uncertainty to the model, we are using multi-agent systems uh, modeling based on interactions. So these are mainly transition probabilities with certain amount of, of degree of freedom. So at the end, what we would create, let's say, or what the model will do, is that you input certain amount of, of publicly available data that you can find in different sources online uh, regarding the climate, regarding the geographic location, the socioeconomic conditions of the household, the, the demographic characteristics as well, or the type of fuels that they are currently using. And then you can estimate the load profiles. How much electricity are they consuming at each time of the day? So this is just an example of a case study that was made for Kenya, in which we collected um, electricity consumption data directly from the households, and then we compared it to system simulation approaches and to our simulations. So here you can see, and it was obtained an error of 12% in general. So another form of representing these results is that you can characterize all the consumers if you have the information geographically. So this was also for Kenya and we can we can estimate how many households or how many percentage of the population that we in which we have information from belong to each of the identified clusters or the, each of identified electricity consumers. And what we can do as well is to project their electricity consumption on an aggregated form. So how do we know that these estimations that we make, that these projections that we make are correct? So that's why I previously mentioned that we have collected a lot of electricity measurements from rural households. So we were performing field work in Kenya. That was in the year 2019, before COVID. And um, what we were doing there in Kenya was to visit different villages and to survey people uh, regarding their socioeconomic characteristics regarding their current energy habits and their current habits of, of activity as well, appliances ownership, etc. We were also using this device that you can see here in this meter box. This device was measuring their electricity consumption at every five minutes and we would leave it there for one week. So we would collect data not only for the weekdays but also for the weekends. So then you, we can see what's the difference of consumption in terms of their habits in the weekends and weekdays. We also did this field work recently in Guatemala. That was two months ago. So we were able to perform this field work. Of course, the data collection process through the surveys was not made in person. So we are still collecting data from by, um, by phone. And the interesting part here in, in the field work in Guatemala is that Besides collecting as well electricity consumption data from rural households, we were deploying different educational workshops. 
for these people in the communities in which we were involving local NGOs and local authorities. And that was just to let them know the results of the research, because we consider that it's very important not only um, doing your research and publishing the results, but also that they perceive what you're doing with the data and what's the purpose of it. So uh, talking about the highlights, uh, data-driven models have a lot of potential to solve the global challenges. And that's mainly in developing countries in, you know, in which you don't have very specific and detailed data in order to perform uh, physical models. This model was based, made uh, based on publicly available data as input, enabled to create high resolution electricity profiles from rural households, which will help us to close the energy access gap. Because at the end, these high resolution electricity profiles are required to design the electrification solutions that you will give to these communities. So talking about more, more in deep about the modeling approach, uh, data-driven models are scalable. So that's a great advantage that they have. Uh, they are focused on minimizing the errors. So comparing them to the physical uh, models, for example, they are trained based on real observations. And in the meantime, these physical models, you can introduce new errors based on the boundary conditions, for example, and you, you don't know sometimes where these errors come from. So one thing that we can do with these data-driven models as well is that you, you can measure uncertainty. You can measure the confidence levels of your model. So those are the advantages. The disadvantages <laughs> are that your models depend deeply on the data quality and the amount. If you don't have really good quality of data, if you don't perform a really good processing and cleaning of your data, then your results will not be that reliable. And of course, you require computational time and power. So just to give you an example, uh, yeah, working with developing countries with rural areas, <laughs> It's, it's quite complicated because all the data that you got, you don't even know if it's reliable or not. So I spent like mostly 80% of the time just cleaning this data and trying to process this data in order to introduce them and create the models. And then for training the models, uh, you can spend, yeah, it depends on the amount of data that you have. But for example, for India, <laughs> which is the, the largest population that I have been uh, examining lately, it took me almost 48 hours to train the model for India. So of course, yeah, it can take time. And if you don't have computational power, that could be an issue. So if you're interested in, in reading about our work, these are some publications. And this work was funded by an ETH grant and also by the Urban Energy Systems Laboratory at EMPA. So here is my contact if you have any doubt or if you want to connect. And I look forward to your questions if you have. Hello, Christina. Very, very nice presentation. Thank you for that. I have two questions. One is about the workshops and um, you did during the field works. Do you have already impacts? Do you see already some, um, some changes for the better? Thank you very much for your question, Donat. Uh, yeah, actually, we cannot measure this impact. So the only thing that we can actually do is that we were giving a lot of information regarding how they can save uh, electricity. So how they can reduce their electricity bills. And we have been contacting them as well. And they are willing to, to actually do the advices that we recommend them to do. And they, some of them already started. So one thing that we did as well in these workshops was to provide LED lamps so they could start to change right away. So we, we show them what's the difference between the different light bulbs that you have in the market from incandescent, from uh, fluorescent and LED. And they knew right away that the LED was the most convenient for them. And they already owned the incandescent ones, for example, that consumed the most. So they already changed these this light bulbs and that has an impact already on their electricity consumption. 
Okay, cool. Uh, about the cleaning of the data, that, that's another other question I had. Um, what do you mean by cleaning? Um, how can I imagine that in, in practice? So do you change formats or is the data messy? Uh, yeah, sometimes, well, most of the times I will say you will have outliers in your data. So I have been trying, having a lot of issues with the data, especially from the time use. So this, this template of diaries that in which they are recording each of the activities that they perform during the day. So in that uh, specific template of data collection, of course, you will have a lot of people that just will record, yes, I'm sleeping the whole day just because they are lazy to record their activity. Oh. So, so I have found a lot of different cases like this, or they, they just put like unrealistic things that you can notice, that you can note just by looking at the data. So yeah, you do this kind of cleaning process to just try to treat your outlayers, either if you if it's more convenient to remove them or to transform them. For example, there are a lot of techniques such as imputation of, of missing data as well. And you can do a lot of formatting and pre-processing of your data before um, putting into the machine learning models and before training your model. So you will have reliable and robust results. Okay. Thank you. Sure.